Susie, are you ready to go? Are you prepared? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm just going to, you know, follow my 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 talk here. This is something I know that you're comfortable giving this type of talk anyway, so. Um, well, any talk that you have a PowerPoint, it's pretty easy to give. You yeah. Know. <laughs> <laughs> Having your knowledge in it is very helpful, too. <laughs> it's just, you know, I've done this in Japan. I've done it in China. Not this talk, but I mean, I've given PowerPoints in all over the world. And so, you know, I've even given talks to people that don't speak English, you know, and they have it. They have it in Japanese. They have the mm -hmm. same PowerPoint in Japanese next to the mine in English. Oh, that's neat. That's neat. Yeah. Yeah, so You're a true educator, Susie. Everybody speaks English, so this makes it kind of easy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's go ahead and get going. So, so thank you, everybody, for joining us today for our uh, regular Master Gardener Volunteer Lecture Series program. Today we have Susie Lyons. She's one of our awesome Master Gardener Volunteers, and she is going to be speaking all about invasive plants in North Central Florida um, because, well, they're everywhere and uh, we have some we want to talk about control methods but also like the alternatives to them and Susie you know one of our avid master gardener volunteers is very knowledgeable about this so um, Susie thank you very much for taking the time putting this presentation together and we I know that the audience and I and myself we're really excited to hear about what you have to say so thank you very much great hello everybody it's um, apropos that I'm here because I live on property where I have tons of invasive plants, always. They always return. So welcome and enjoy uh, learning a few things about your yard and what, what invasives are in your yard. So first, I think, um, you know, if we just look at what is an invasive plant or a non-native plant, um, it's, it usually means that it's been introduced uh, to an area from their, their native range, either you know, purposefully or accidentally. And it's plants from other countries usually or continents or regions. And um, of the 400, approximately four, 1400 uh, Florida plants that are non-natives, um, many are not invasive and many support you know, economic interaction and crop production and landscaping. And, and many of them are well-managed. Um, uh, so they, many, most of the other exotics present minor problems, um, you know, along the roadsides or what have you. Um, and at the end, I've given you the names of some resources if you want to check them out. But the Florida Exotic Pest Plant Council's list um, of invasive plants um, is really great. And they come out with new ones every year. So there's been one since the 15 list. There's been one in 17 and in 2019. And at the time in, the, in 2015, only about 11% of, of all those exotic species um, were um, causing problems. So I think uh, what we really um, want to know is that <clears throat> these exotic plants <clears throat> on this list, they actually alter the native plant community by displacing native species. Uh, they change the community structure or the ecological functions or hybridize with nat natives. And it just messes things up. I mean, I've watched down at the end of the, at the lake, I've watched these yellow iris take over the purple iris. I mean, it, it's, it happens right before your very eyes. You can, you can see it happening. Um, so uh, an invasive plant is non-indigenous, it's non-native, and it, it adversely impacts habitats or, um, you know, and you'll see it, you'll know it. And this is some of the ones that, that um, we looked at that seem to be a little bit more common. Um, and the ones that are asterisked are the ones that are, are definitely in my, on my property and more, I have more than this too, but, um, and you'll probably able to go through those and, um, and see which ones are on your, your property. And I thought what I do is ask you some questions to ponder during the PowerPoint so that you can see, you know, how, which invasives are in your yard, none, all, you know, one to five, five to 10. Um, watch during this PowerPoint to find out. Um, hey, Susie, can we actually, in the chat box, I want to take an opportunity with that. Um, yeah. If, 
all the participants in the chat box, you know, do you know what invasive species you may have in your landscape or that maybe not in your yard, but maybe in your neighborhood that you see on a regular basis? And then maybe at the at the end, we'll ask the same question. We'll kind of see if you start to think of more plants that are in your landscape. Yes, 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 yes. Good idea. Um, mm, you know, and the other, the other question was, you know, what percentage of your time is spent ridding your yard of invasives? It, mm. For me, I spend about 88% of my time getting rid of invasives. That's pretty much what I focus on every day is removing some invasives. And then I, how do you remove them? Is it chemical, biological, or um, practical, physical? Uh, what do you call that? Uh, mechanical. Mechanical, yes. And then how do you discard them? Uh, think about that, how you remove them, how you discard them. And, um, and if there are any aggressive, uh, maybe not necessarily invasive, but aggressive plants in your yard that are not on this list, um, because we also need to watch the behaviors of those plants um, for the future and to warn people of that. Yeah, and we're getting some really good uh, comments in the chat box. So like Ardesia, um, right. one person put fern, which Boston fern. Um, yeah. So like the wandering Jew, lantana, the elephant ears. Um, so Mexican petunia, yeah. So oh, yeah. we'll, we'll talk a lot about this, but you know, some people said, um, I have no idea. So that's good. Yes. Um, that yes. because we'll, we'll learn about some of these, the very common ones. Yes. Um, yes. So, yeah, I've got, I've got at least 13, um, but I'm sure I have more, you know? Um, and so you'll probably go, aha, when you see the pictures, you'll go, oh my God, yes, I've got that in, you know, corner of my land. Um, and then I've I've actually shared pictures of some things that I have or that are close by me that are also quite aggressive that you might want to be aware of um, in the future. Uh, so does anybody know what this plant is? Can you ID it? I don't think it's a rice paper plant. And I I went to Garden Answers and couldn't ID it. It's it's but it's growing like crazy in my neighbor's yard and now it's in my yard. So just keep it in mind if anybody feels like doing a plan ID on it. Um, feel yeah. free. <laughs> uh, I have a couple things that are nowhere to be found. I, I can't, I haven't been able to identify them. So kind of looks like a type of fatsia, but I can't tell. Yeah, in fact, I don't know why I have two of the same pictures because I actually downloaded one that was closer up. So I'll, I'll get a closer up one for you. Um, so who decides who, what's, what is um, invasive? Um, there's a couple of different organizations that do. And again, you can look up any of these organizations that you want to, to find out who decides. And they issue this report every two years, the FLEEPC, the Florida Exotic um, Plant Council, Exotic and uh, uh, Florida. Oh, geez. I can't remember what the EE stands for. What does the EE stand for? Exotic or, well, whatever. These are the three organizations that decide who is. Uh, it is sorry. It's, it's actually just F L E. I used to do this. It's F L E P P C. P -P -C. So it's Florida Exotic Pest Plant Council. That's right. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, the group, this invasive plant group was established in 99 uh, and then they set up this predictive tool and um, they assessed 800, over 850 plants in 2015. They, um, they determined which plants by zone, north, central or south are invasive. Um, and it's very helpful. It really, it, it's a fantastic list and I'll, I'll share it with you later. Um, the, the pamphlet they, that they um, share. So why should we care? Um, Florida is especially vulnerable because of its geography, climate, and diverse ecosystem. And if you know anything about Florida, everything grows in Florida and it grows like crazy. So approximately, also approximately 85% of all the non-native plant species enter the U.S. through Florida. So we're very, it's very crucial that we uh, are aware of this in Florida. Uh, 
42% of all threatened or endangered plant species are in decline because of invasives. That was from 2005. I don't know the newest data, but it was pretty bad back then. I'm hoping it's a little bit better um, 15 years later. And nearly 50% of all land in Florida is under development or used for agriculture. And actually we've seen more than that. That percentage is higher as the years have been going by. Um, more and more of Florida is being developed and it's just really changing uh, the way things grow and what is grown and how it's grown. <clears throat> so the first one is arrowhead vine. And um, I'm trying to get this scooted over. Uh, arrowhead vine has high ecological impact in the southern and central zones. Um, its older plants have compound leaves which look different from those of the seedlings. Uh, so, um, you know, this, this vine is, can climb up trees and all over wooded areas and it's really quite um, invasive. And the alternative would be uh, gingers, jacobinia, or the holly fern. Um, the, uh, you know, the jacobinia is absolutely beautiful and it, it provides color. And then the holly fern, of course, provides uh, texture. Um, and then the gingers are, are wonderful too because they, they grow well and very easily. And um, so these would be great alternatives to arrowhead vine. Uh, then the horrid Boston fern, uh, tuber sword fern, or asparagus fern. Um, both of these you, you can see everywhere uh, along the side of the road or in your backyard. Um, I will tell you though that a couple weeks ago I went on a eat the weed uh, three, three hours with Dean Green and I didn't realize it, but the Boston fern, the, the good thing about Boston fern is the little, and uh, you can see what the sword fern looks like up close and personal. And this is what it looks like when it's been frozen this winter. And then down further towards the lake, you can see how doggone healthy it is. It just has taken over um, various parts of my yard. That's, that's my backyard part of it. Um, and, it's, and now that those have been frozen back, it's the perfect time for me to pull them up because they're vis very visible, can see if there's any snakes in there and can um, pull them out and put them in bags and throw them away in the trash, which is the way you wanna get rid of most of the invasives. Um, and then this is an alternative. And actually what I find that I do is I dig these up that are growing in my yard and I just put them where the Boston fern were. I'll take out some Boston fern and put these alternative ferns in um, there and it starts to then take, take hold and, and I can keep removing the Boston ferns. So this is a good alternative, this fern, autumn fern, uh, and they grow really well. The camphor tree, I don't have, at least I don't think I have this on my property. Um, but it's a pretty big tree and it's native to uh, Japan, uh, came to Florida in 1875 and it's displacing native trees. Um, so uh, the way to identify it is by um, peeling a twig or a bark and smelling it and it smells like camphor. Um, so, you know, I'm gonna actually go look around for this because I haven't seen it in my yard, but I bet I have it. And an alternative to this would be the Loblolly Bay or the American Holly or the Culinary Bay Tree because then you can still, you know, break off the bay leaves and smell it if you want something that's smelly. Uh, and you can also have some white flowers and some um, berry, the berry look. So <clears throat> these are great alternatives for the camphor tree. Cat's claw, God forbid. The way that I got familiar with cat's claw was I worked at the SOS garden at Coffin Park um, when they did a cleanup a couple of weeks ago. And that was really the first time I got up and close, close and personal with cat's claw vine and got to know it really well. So now I can spot it really easily now that I've pulled about, you know, 85 plants from that place. Um, 
it has a claw-like climbing appendage. You can see in the bottom right-hand corner, there's three little claws like, and they stick to the tree and they just go straight up it. They have no trouble at all attaching themselves to anything. And um, even though they have a pretty <clears throat> plant or a pretty flower, you wanna pull these down and cut them at the base and then pull them out because they have tubers. Uh, so you wanna dig down along the side of the trees and get down deep enough that you can pop up the tubers um, so that you can really stop it from continuing to grow. Uh, that's it, uh, uh, that's out at Coffin Park. I took a picture of it. Um, it's very, it's extremely difficult to, to control. Um, extremely difficult, but it, it pulls off pretty easily. And then you can dig up the tuberous root below pretty easily if you just get in at the right angle and, and uh, leverage it up. And the alternative, you can still get a yellow flower if you want some Carolina jasmine or coral honeysuckle or uh, cross vine. So you can still get, you know, really pretty vine and very pretty flowers um, without it being cat's claw. Uh, so go hey, walk. Susie, away. do yes. you know what the the um, the the seeds look like for the cat's claw? We had a question come in, like how can we recognize it uh, before it spreads? Good question. I don't. Let's see. I don't know what the seeds look like, but I do know what it, what underground it looks like. It's that top left hand corner. They're less than the size of a dime, and they're round tubers um, that just have a pretty long. Um, root that goes down, but I don't know what the seeds look like. Yeah, if Does I remember know? correctly, I think the biggest reason that they're known for their propagation and spreading is because of those underground tubers. Yeah, um, it's not necessarily this like a, a seed. Um, okay. So yeah, you don't want to just cut them, you know, somewhere on the tree and and know that they're going to die above that area. You want to dig down next to the tree and leverage up those tubers. You want to definitely get the tubers. Yeah, that's our biggest concern with those is those tubers because that's where they're primarily spreading from. But they do, they do create, if I remember correctly, like a long. They can create a long seed pod, kind of like a long green bean. Okay. So um, and they're they're like twelve to eighteen inches long. And so those could always be a great way if you if those are available, you can collect them and dispose of them to help prevent dispersion. So, okay. yeah. Great. But great. I think the I think the the little nodules is one of our other major concerns with it. But that's a good good question to bring up. It really is. Very good question. Yeah, because I don't think I've seen the seed pods, but I'll keep an eye out for that. Uh, yeah, it's a little it's a it's a devil of a of a vine. And these are so pretty. The alternatives are so pretty. So, I mean, you know, at least we've got alternatives. And the other one that didn't have a regular photo from, um, from any publication was the Caesar's weed. I also got familiar with Caesar's weed at Coffin Park at the SOS and outside the SOS garden because they told me when I arrived that I had worn the wrong jacket. I wore a fleece jacket and they said, oh my God, Susie, that's the wrong jacket to wear when you were picking Caesar's weed. And sure enough, when I went in to pick this Caesar's weed, I had all those little fuzzy things all over my fleece jacket and anybody else with the fleece jacket, we all met back at the end and picked these off of ourselves, of each other, because you couldn't see them. And if you took any of those back, you're spreading it. So um, Caesar's weed has, um, it's a green, I don't think I had a picture of the leaf, but it's, it's, once you see it, then you know what it looks like from then on, especially if you've picked 75 or 80 of them. Um, and again, you have to pull, you have to um, dig these out from the root. And, um, but this is what it looks like, you know, after, after the, the green has died off and you see these just, oh my God. I mean, there must be, 20 square yards of Caesar's weed in right off the SOS garden. Um, and it's just, it's I have just a picture of Mary White's hands. So I'm going to see if I can get that okay. and upload it so everyone can see it because her, her hands, she's wearing pink gloves. So oh. you see her hands are just covered in the Caesar's weed oh my as God. she's trying to pull them all off. So I'm going to get that picture and upload it so everyone can see it. 
Okay, great. Yeah, and it's and I can't I can't see if there's any right around this the greens, but I I didn't have that picture. I forgot to, to download that picture, but we'll get that the fuzzy things. But it's very obvious when you see this um, what it looks like. And then there's Chinese tallow tree, and um, you know, granted, you can it was used ornamentally, and it, you make soap, and it naturalized in over half of of Florida. Um, and it's a small, it's a small to medium sized tree. It can grow about 20 feet tall, but some can reach even higher and better not to have this, better to have the red bud or the American hawthorn beam, um, the red maple, um, all of, cause you can see it's a pretty one and it has color leaves that change colors and, and, you know, some berries. So if you go with the red maple, you'll get some red color. Um, and it's a great um, alternative to the Chinese tallow. <clears throat> it's a nice big tree. Oh, and the godforsaken coral ardesia. This and the uh, this and the air potato. I don't have air potato on this because it's just such an obvious thing, and because we've got such, you know, we've got those. Isn't it a beetle that that we can release to kill the that they eat up the leaves like lace? So fortunately. Even though in spring you start to panic because the leaves start to come out on the air potato and they don't release the new um, beetles I found out till October. So you kind of have to hold your breath and, and say a few prayers that it doesn't get so, so horrible until the beetles start coming out on their own. Because they come out when there's enough air potato leaves for them to eat on. So you have to wait for there to be enough air potato leaves and then they start to munch on them and, and they're okay. But coral ardesia is the second worst, and that's what the greater the great invader raider rally is all about. For a long time, it was the air potato roundup, and now it's it focuses a lot of its energies on the coral ardesia. And honest to God, that lower picture around Clear Lake, we probably have acres that look like that. And Wendy comes into our area often um, for the greater the great raider rally, and we we take an area and pull all the berries off of it. Um, and there's a little device you can get that's heavy and it's a pain in the neck, and you're always bruising the bottom of your legs using it. But it's something that leverages out the entire plant after you've taken the berries off, which is the best way to approach this is to take the berries off first put them in a bag and then the rest of the plant, what we've been taught is just turn the plant upside down with the roots hanging in a, in a tree and it will die. It won't continue to, to flourish. And, but always throw away the berries, not the whole plant because that will put holes in the bag and then all the berries will get out. Um, but they, these are, st I still see these sold. I mean, and they shouldn't be uh, They're I mean, they're just terrible. And these, of course, are great alternatives. I've got the beauty berry. I don't have the other, the other, oh, I did buy a wild coffee. So I'm gonna be planting that soon. But the beauty berry, heck, if anybody needs beauty berry, I probably have 50 of them right now because they do, they're, they, they do spread, um, but they're absolutely beautiful. And you get the berry and you get the colors. And um, so the great thing is, is we have alternatives that look pretty like, because the coral ardesia, you can't deny it. It looks beautiful, uh, perfectly at, at Christmas. Actually, it's perfect at Christmas time. But um, we just don't want that. Um, we want these other alternatives. Dutchman's pipe, um, native to Brazil. It's a climbing vine and a perennial, and uh, it's also known as calico vine, and it grows pretty, pretty long, ten to fifteen feet. Um, it, um, the seeds are winged and, and can invade non-disturbed sites. So you don't want this in your property, on your property. But the alternative is the native Dutchman's pipe. Um, and I would say passion flower. American wisteria, listen, I think all wisteria is pretty wild and crazy in Florida. And the the wisteria that I have is not the American um, wisteria, and it is wild. I mean, I have roots that are that are this big, that are two and three inches 
um, wide. I have huge roots because they're about 60 or 70 years old. So, um, you know, even with the American wisteria, wisteria, if it's in a great space, it's going to grow a lot. Um, so the passion flower is beautiful. Um, it actually, I think, is prettier than the Dutchman's pipe, but in a different way. Um, so you can still get these beautiful flowers without having them be an exotic and a, and a non-native. Of course, the elephant ear, the wild taro. I think when we went to the persimmon man's property uh, a year or two ago, he gave us all taro, if I'm not mistaken. So I don't know whether it's the wild taro, but I'm going to check mine before I put it in the ground. That's for dog on sure. Uh, it can grow nine feet high. Um, and the elephant ears, oh my God, I probably pull out 30 of them a year, you know, in my yard because they're just all over the place because they, I have great soil. Uh, so in, in um, alternative to it, of course, is gingers and I'm a fan of gingers because I have a bunch of them in my property. The philodendrons do really quite well and to fill in a space and have big, you know, greenery and then the pickerel weed um, down near some bodies of water. Um, those, they're all great um, alternatives to the wild type tarot. Any comments or questions thus far? Uh, we have some questions that are coming in, but uh, some of them have relate to some like other little things and uh, Christy and I are helping answer those. Okay. Um, but here is one that does relate that I actually just saw um, is okay. going back to the Dutchman's pipe. Yeah. Um, is, do you know how the easiest way to tell the difference between that the native and the invasive Dutchman pipe? Uh, good question. Uh, no, I don't. Is it, does that have something to do with the leaf? So I, Aristolochia is telling the difference is actually really hard. I I can't off the top of my head think of how to tell the difference um, between them. Um, that might be a good uh, a good little project. Back sheet. There we go. Yeah. Try so to find I the difference and and to get some idea. Maybe the leaves look shinier on the native. Mm -hmm. uh, just from first glance and um and the native looks a little more colorful not as dark brown mm -hmm. um at least in these pictures so that might be an interesting thing to 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 look for and to Absolutely. find differences between the two good question so we did have another question that came in um yep. And I actually have two of them on two questions that popped up um, and they go back to the wisteria because I, I don't want to go too far back, but um, how are you telling that? How do you tell the difference between the native and the invasive wisterias? Oh, good question. I'll tell you, I've got the, um, the, the invasive that I keep continue to try to get rid of and um, just first glance at this picture and knowing what my wisteria are, the wisteria flowers are much longer and more pointed uh, in the, in the um, exotic and the invasive. And it looks like the natives look like they're rounded. They're a little bit more compact. Yes. Yeah. That's how I try to tell the difference. Now, if Mark was on here, he'd probably tell us, you know, <laughs> something very precise. But yeah, that's how I usually, and the, the native wisteria, it does climb just like the invasive one, but it's, it stays, it stays a little bit more controlled, obviously. Um, but yeah. the flower shape is usually how I tell the difference is the size of the sh the flower. Mm -hmm. Long ones invasive, short ones, stumpy ones are native. All right. So, mm -hmm. And was there another question? So they were both, they both had to relate, they both related to that one. Um, All right. And it looks like too that the, um, and the smell. That's a, that's one that some people put in here, and that's right. The smell, which is has, which is smells better. Or so the the wisteria, wisteria. I think the invasive one is the one that has a very pronounced smell. Very to, pronounced. Yeah. Very pronounced. And I, you know, based on my experience with wisteria, I'll double check though. Sorry. Okay. Based on my experience with wisteria, I wouldn't even plant the American wisteria, because. <laughs> It's just wisteria is pretty 
pretty aggressive. Yeah, the invasive is more fragrant than the native. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, let's move on to English ivy. And of course, here at the University of Florida, most of you will remember that so many of the buildings at the University of Florida used to be completely covered by, by English ivy. I mean covered. It was, it was part of their look was English ivy all over their red brick buildings. Um, and boy, does it, does it grow. You can see all the, all the roots along the stem are just, uh, it, it, it can climb any wall, any structure. Um, and an alternative to that would be uh, the, I don't know how this is kind of a strange alternative. The first one I can see being an alternative, but monkey grass and lyrope and mondo grass, I don't know, doesn't seem like the same as English ivy. Um, uh, so that is what was proposed by some IFAS literature, but I would think of a different, I would think of a different ivy. I mean, I would think of a different vine um, as an alternative to English ivy. If anybody has any ideas. The monkey grass and mondo grass uh, can be used as ground cover, uh, which is probably why they're- That's why it's on there. Because ah, that's okay. why ivy is how some people use ivy. Yes, 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 you're right. I always see it. I always think of it as on buildings, but you're right, you're right. And believe me, mondo grass, great. Part of my yard is mondo grass. I think the guy who lived here before me 70 years ago, I think planted it because I'm on a hill and it's the runoff from the road, um, the upper road. And I think he planted it specifically to hold all the soil in place. Mm -hmm. So I have tons of Mondo grass. Anybody needs Mondo grass, I've got it. <laughs> um, I've got it and Lyrope too. And they're wonderful. The Lyrope is beautiful with the, with the um, purple flowers that come out. It's wonderful. And the Mondo grass is soft. And when you mow it, it's nice and thick and everything, it's really pretty. Okay, Chinese privet or glossy privet. Again, I don't think I have, I don't think I have this. This, it was, na it's native to Asia. It's about 50 species. Uh, it came to US in 1952. So it's been here a long time and it tolerates air pollution and other, you know, poor environmental conditions. It can grow to be really high, 30 feet in height. Um, and it gr grows from seed or from root or stump sprouts. So it's, very um, able to, to spread on its own quite well. And an alternative would be the Japanese privet um, and or arrowwood or Florida anise. And of course, Florida anise is really cool when you break the leaves, it smells really good. Um, so again, we're lucky we it's this, this privet is not good, but the Japanese privet is so um, and it behaves similarly. So um, you know, you can enjoy the same look for with the native, I mean, with the non-invasive. This one drives me out of my ever living mind. I probably cut down last year, at least a thousand of these, all of them about seven feet tall in my back area that I've been clearing. Um, and there's tons of them up the street. So I know a bunch of it's rolling right down. And I'm sure many of you have seen it. I think it's on University Avenue. There's huge rain trees on University Avenue that are in bloom. They're giant trees and they're absolutely beautiful. They're really, really pretty, but they're not, uh, they're invasive. They're not good for the environment and they germinate quickly and they grow tall and not good. Um, and these are the alternatives that are suggested. The Palat East Palat Kahali, the sourwood or the wild olive. Um, they're not quite the same, but um, they will give you shade and a tree shape and, um, um, but it's, they're good alternatives. Um, they can grow in similar conditions. That rain tree is just so pretty, but it's, a, it's, really, it's really invasive. It's really something else. Um, and then, of course, they didn't put Nandina on this title, but Heavenly Bamboo Boo makes it sound so great. And uh, it's not. It's from Ch Japan and China. And it was introduced as an ornamental because it is pretty with the red, red and, you know, with the little white yellow flowers and the red berries. And it really does look pretty and it fritters in the wind and it's just absolutely wonderful. Um, but 
you don't want this uh, in your garden. And I think I have a couple left. Colin just said earlier that he finally removed his last one um, from his yard. And I think I still have about like two areas where I have one or two or three in them that I have to get rid of them. Um, and some people say, well, you know, I only keep one and, but the birds will take those fruits and not good, not good. So the alternative would be the fringe tree. And I did not, the fringe, uh, Chinese fringe plant, I did not get a picture of my fringe tree in bloom, um, but it's really, really cool. Um, I, and the Chinese Mahonia and the Abelia. I don't know those um, really well, but, um, but they're great alternatives to the Nandina. And they give you, you know, some little flowers and the same kind of effect. And I would argue that a great replacement for heavenly bamboo, even though it's not red, um, is the yesterday, today and tomorrow plant. Have you guys seen this before? I love those. Um, oh man, they're wonderful. <laughs> you know, I have had it in the same place. It was there when I moved here in 2006. It never bloomed until I got ready for a new roof and solar panels. And I cut one limb of an oak tree off the edge of the roof and bam, I had blooms for the first time in 16 years. And I was just like, oh my God, this is fantastic. And it changes, the, the flowers change um, to three different colors in just a couple of days. But I did learn that all parts of it are toxic to dogs. So what, what was planted around this is a prayer plant. So nothing gets near it. It's completely surrounded by an, another big ground cover plant and it just, goes off on his own and I trim it every year. Now I've trimmed it once and it came back and can't wait till it blooms again. But I would argue that this is a good alternative for a couple of different of um, exotics because it's absolutely beautiful. It grows without care, absolute neglect, and it it's just gorgeous. Okay, the Japanese honeysuckle um, came to us in early 1900s. And um, it's invasive. It's got a woody twining vine. Uh, it, uh, it makes its way into all kinds of forest edges, roadsides, fields, etc. And birds eat the fruits and disperse the seeds. Um, there's no getting around it. It's got a beautiful fragrant white flower. So that part is nice, but we don't want those in our yards. Um, the alternatives would be a coral honeysuckle, so you get some smell, the Carolina jasmine. Um, so you can still get, you know, a vine and flowers and um, and real and color if you just take those the Japanese honeysuckle out and um, add in the coral honeysuckle or the Carolina jasmine. And by the way, everybody's getting this, um, so you don't have to remember all these and you're gonna get it so you can refer to it and, and, and walk around with your computer and look at everything in your yard. Um, okay, so this one, I, I found a picture of it um, because I have this really great waterproof or rainproof packet of two-sided cards from the store on campus um, of all the invasives and then and the exotics so I can carry it around with me it's it's like uh, three by six three by five and I can carry it with me and this Japanese climbing firm when you see it you know it right away because it it really it forms tangled masses all over ground cover and shrubs and it eliminates everything underneath it and it can be 90 feet long and you really want to get rid of this um, when you see it um, and I think a lot of people don't know about the Japanese climbing fern, um, or if they do, you know, you really need to, I mean, when I'm at somebody's house in St. Augustine, I saw it and I went, oh my God, we've got to get rid of it, you know, and they said, why, why, it's so pretty, it looks good, oh no, 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 it's going to take over, it's going to be bad for you, uh, and I, and again, it's a climbing fern, so an alternative would be, uh, you know, any of the ferns, or, or even some of the vines, um, if you want um, a vine, like any of the vines we've talked about that are alternatives to other vines. It's pretty, but it's bad. 
Okay, Lantana. Now, when I drive down my road on the right-hand side, not only are there 50 rain trees, but there are probably 50 Lantana underneath them. And um, they're quite obvious. Uh, they came to us oof, back in the 18th century, way back, and found in every county in Florida. And they're, they're grown as a hedge plant. They have medicinal uses. Um, and it, it reproduces um, you know, via seed or vegetatively. Um, and there are some, some that are not invasive. Um, and there's other, the Lantana camarara, I think it is, beach sunflowers or guara. Um, any of those would be good alternatives to the Lantana because you still get the flowers and you still get the, you know, some of the um, unique qualities of the stem and, and the leaf um, is textured. So some of these other plants give you some of that texture, color, you know, flowers. Um, but there are, there are, there is a lantana you can plant and use, uh, just not, just not uh, the wedelia. That's not good. That's an amazing. Okay, so this is not on the list, <clears throat> and I don't know why it's not. And I'm pretty sure it might be at some point, at least on the category two list of plants that are very aggressive and are on the watch. Have, has anybody seen these? The Mexican hydrangea? Every single one of those doggone, adorable, beautiful little flowers up there becomes another plant. It's very aggressive. It's very difficult to control. You have to remove the tops before it blooms. Otherwise it starts to blow around and seed itself. And I'll show you just a little bit of what it looks like when it does its own thing. And that's only in one small section of the side of my yard. And I would say I have that five times that amount of, of plants growing in my yard. And I think there used to be three. So I don't know why it's not on the list. I couldn't find it on the list. Do you know, Taylor? Have you seen that on the list or anything? It, no, it, it's not on the list. And I'm even looking up because they were all reassessed from IFAS assessment within the past few years and none of them have, um, have none of them hit all the benchmarks to be considered an invasive species, not even one that's of caution status. Um, I think they just grow well here. Um, well, warning, warning, warning. Do because not they're all over, they're all over high springs in our natural area. So, exactly. but it's not considered invasive. Um, I'm, I'm going through and checking all of them. Yeah, I couldn't uh, find it anywhere, but I just want to warn everyone that, that actually this is one that somebody gave me one and I put it in there. And, and that's why it's, it's, and now it's like this five times this amount. Um, so just because it grows wonderfully and, and it spreads, don't dig those up and give them away because, or any plant, you want to learn about it first before you plant it, because this is the kind of stuff that can come into your yard and take over. So it's very aggressive. It grows very well in my yard and elsewhere, clearly. And I bet at some point, this is going to be on the list, at least the watch list. Yeah, I think, I think that brings up a good point of distinction. It is, it grows really well here in Alachua County. Um, but does it meet all those benchmarks to be considered an invasive species? And um, like IFAS assessment, they are assessing hundreds of plants each year um, and reevaluate them every few years to determine what their invasive potential is and if they are considered invasive. So just because plants aren't in listed as invasive doesn't mean that they they don't spread well, um, but they're not meet, meeting all those benchmarks to be considered invasive. So this is a good example of, it's not hitting all those benchmarks to be considered invasive, but it does, it can still spread quickly. So if it's in your landscape, it's gonna be something that you have to manage because it can move around your landscape outside of where you want it to be. 
Right. So then it becomes more of a weed than it does an invasive plant. Yes, and a pretty weed at that. But <laughs> right. Uh, you know, but so I, I, I um, have some in my neighborhood, and I was talking to somebody the first time I ever saw it. I said, "Oh, that's beautiful, a Clarendrum." She said, "You don't want to get this," and pointed me to the neighbor's yard, <laughs> <laughs> where it had already spread, and was continuing to spread. Yeah. Um, it's it's one of those. I wouldn't recommend that to anybody. It's beautiful and the flowers are spectacular and there are several other different types of clarigendrum. Right. But um, uh, they are a bit of a problem. Yeah. yeah. And big. that specific that specific one, I think, is that Rose Glory Bower. There's like eight different clarodendrons that grow uh, in this area. And uh, that clarodendron bungi, I think, is the one that you have in the image, um, was last assessed in 2015 so there should be a new assessment coming out very okay. soon okay well we'll see we'll see but just be everybody beware of that and don't share it with anybody because it's i pull hmm i think i recently i pulled about 120 and i know i'm going to pull another 500 before you know the the month is out and of course the mexican petunia you know, it's so pretty, you know, the flowers are so pretty, etc. cetera. Uh, it came to us in 1940. Um, it bunches, it spreads, it's, it spreads underground stems or rhizomes and it is, it is very invasive. And fortunately we have um, alternatives that are just as pretty. Um, and in fact, there's a native wild petunia and I think it's pink if I'm not mistaken, and Mary Fullerton gave me some of her. So, and the plumbago, of course, is wonderful. And it's got a very similar color to the, the plant, maybe bluer, it's bluer than that. Um, and the salvias are pretty too, you know, but plumbago and native wild petunia, they grow up high, they have flowers and um, they're quite pretty, um, but uh, not, the Mexican petunia. We want to stay clear of that purple, the one with the purple. It grows tall and has the purple uh, trumpet-like plants on the end of it. And then, of course, everybody loves mimosa. When I was a kid, we would love blowing those little things off of them, and um, we thought they were the greatest, and they smelled great, and we'd always walk down and pull a bunch and smell them as kids. But they grow huge, and they produce vegetatively and by seed. And you can see the big seeds hanging in the tree, seed pods. Um, it's a really pretty plant. I will be the first to say, I think it's absolutely beautiful and I really love it. It's very ornamental, you know, showy flowers, very fragrant, just wonderful, but it is an invasive. So we really want to cut those babies down and replant them with the bottle brush or the tree or the fringe tree. And you can see this, the, this uh, or the cassia, so that you can still get some pretty flowers. You can still get some fragrance. And of course, I mean, the fringe tree, I wish I had gotten a picture, could find the picture of mine because it's about mm, 30 feet tall and you have this one week of it all white, like, like a beard. And then all of a sudden it's pretty green and just gorgeous. We had one question that says, you know, for some of these larger trees, how do we get rid of them? Um, unfortunately, like if you have larger trees on your property, um, depending on how large it is, I, tree removal is very, very dangerous. So it would have to be a arborist and you can get an arborist. Um, I can send out that link with the, I'll do a follow up at the end of the presentation and I'll include a link on how to find an arborist. There's an online directory um, because they will come in and they'll do that, that cut of big trees if you don't feel comfortable. And sometimes you have to do herbicide treatments on those trees. Um, and typically what you do is um, some trees you have best recommendations, but the usually a cut stump method is what we call where as soon as you cut the tree, you just paint the outside edge of the cut or that tr of the trunk um, with your herbicide. So it gets sucked in. So you're not, so you're limiting how much herbicide you have to use. Yeah, another good way to use the herbicide, um, an arborist, arborist told me when I was trying to get rid of my wisteria was use a tiny paintbrush, put 
of food coloring in your herbicide so that you can clearly see where it is. And I actually scraped those large vines of my wisteria and then I dipped the paintbrush in the food colored herbicide and I painted it right on the area that I scraped on the on the vine. And then I could see exactly where the herbicide goes. I didn't kill any of the azaleas that it was all over because I only treated the vine itself of the wisteria. And then you can be very careful, keep it in a jar that doesn't break, keep it closed up, and but use a tiny little um, paintbrush. And that really helps control that spread. And I will tell you that the majority of the ways that I get rid of all my, my stuff is mechanical. I pull, cut, drag, dig, you name it. And I've even had my brother out with a little saw to saw off some of those rain tree. But they're not huge at, at the moment, but I mean, I think he cut maybe a hundred of them with a little saw. And then I could go and I followed him and I painted all the, you know, the tops of them. Um, but I do a lot of mechanical. I get a lot of exercise in my yard because I do tons of mechanical um, removal. In fact, I don't really use herbicides except on the wisteria. I mean, I just don't. Um, okay, paper mulberry tree. How are we doing on time? You're good. Okay, paper mulberry tree is a no-no. Um, and, but if you get another mulberry tree, the red mulberry, which I have, I think I have one that's probably about 50 feet tall. Sadly, the squirrels, the deer, get all of the mulberries. But where I do a, 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 a work trade at an organic farm at Sambra Farm, I go there every Monday and I get to eat all the mulberries I want. So they must not have animals that eat them very much there or they're too close to their, their, their barn um, for the animals to come up real close. The Eastern red bud is pretty and the oak leaf hydrangea is pretty. So you at least get, you know, again, some interesting leaves so, uh, an interesting um, look um, as well as in the red mulberry, you actually get mulberries. And again, these are the mulberry is the tree that China uses, you know, to grow their silkworm to make silk. And I don't know which mulberry it is, but um, the mulberry tree is pretty important in China. Rattle box. This is one that's, that um, can, you know, last through the winter often and um, it grows about 15, it's a woody shrub and it grows about 15 feet high um, and they have seeds in their pods and it makes a rattling noise and that's where it gets the rattle box name, I'm pretty sure. And the alternative to that would be a uh, shower of gold, coral bean or firebush. So you still get, see the colors. Now this, these are orange and yellow, orangish. Um, so the fire bush is more um, red, but um, you still get the effect of a bush and some color um, if you can get rid of the rattle, um, the rattle box. And then the wandering Jew, I think we probably all have some of this in our yard. Um, and, you know, truthfully, where, where it's been, it always has been, and it hasn't spread that much. Um, so it's a, it, it is kind of a nice ground cover, but it is considered um, invasive. So, um, you know, it's a good idea to remove it because it's, it smothers all the, everything under it, all the other. And it can propagate from every tiny little piece. So say you mow it and it's in your yard it'll propagate and germinate and grow from all the little pieces that you've created. Oh, so it, it spreads very, very easily. Mm -hmm. All right, so I will promise, I will start removing more of it. I don't have tons, but I'll remove it and plant the other stuff. Because the peacock gingers are really wonderful and I have those and I've been putting them in all different places where I want them to um, you know, spread. Uh, the native violets, they're really pretty too, and um, the carpet um, bugle weed, weed. So, um, you know, you have alternatives, so let's use them. Let's get rid of these, these invasives and use them. And then this one I just added for the heck of it because this grows all around our lake, the wild pineapple. 
and um, granted when it ripens you'll have the fruit in the back you can see some of the orange fruit up there and sometimes it turns the inner leaves are red and white and it's absolutely beautiful but it's very spiky and it's um, I, I don't know whether it was purposely planted to keep maybe the alligators from the lake from coming up into the yards but it's it's there's a lot of it and it's I used to have one or two and I think I have 50 now I mean it, it's so it's aggressive and it's spiky and it's spine and you know spiky spines and it's um, it's not a very nice plant to have around if you're going to be walking anywhere near it. Um, but I thought I'd put that in just to warn you that this can it you know it grows from uh, these aggressive um, stolons that go out and then they, there's a new one that comes up. So it's it it can be aggressive. Um, if you don't want something to be blocked, an area to be blocked from, from walking through. Um, and then of course, this is the wisteria. I don't know why I had it before. Oh yeah, I think it was a replacement plant. So see, you can see this wisteria has the long, the long um, flowers um, and the, the native one has the shorter, stubbier, um, more condensed flowers. Um, uh, so the it's it's shade tolerant, but it also can this one can grow anywhere and in the full sun. Um, and the alternative would be this uh, American wisteria that's chubbier, you know, a little stumpier, the blue sky vine or the Confederate jasmine. So you still can get you know fragrance and flowers, and it's pretty, um, and you'll be happy. So I these are just some of the resources that I thought, oh, I got the FLE PPC, correct? Um, this is some of the um, resources. If you Google Greater Invasive Raider Rally, that has lots of information on the invasives that they wanna focus on. And it also has great videos of how to remove them. Um, mostly the most important thing is that when you remove them, you put them in a double bag and you put them in your trash, not your yard waste. Um, very important, but the extension services has tons of information and you can find the exotic pest plant council invasive plant list. This is what it looks like. And every two years they, they update it. So it gives you category one and category two. So that the more invasive on the left, the right are the ones that they're watching. It tells you who put together the, the report. Um, and this is really helpful. And it shows, tells you which zone, if it's in the north, the central or the south part of Florida. Um, I think that, that's, a really helpful, um, that's a really helpful list. So there you go. Um, I think that's probably overload and it's not all of the ones on the list, but it's the ones that I see all the time and that um, at least most of them I see all the time and they're in my yard all, all over the place. So. Um, okay. Wonderful. I've been, I've been going crazy. We've been answering lots of questions on the Q and A. <laughs> yeah. So, but, um, but I, I do think it's important that, um, you know, we, we still have some time that we can an help answer some of the questions that popped up um, in the Q and A. Um, so, and feel free if you have any other questions that you can put in there, but before we do that, you know, Susie, I want to say thank you very much for helping put this presentation together. You're um, welcome. It's very informative and engaging, but the other thing I want to ask before we go into the questions is at the very beginning, we asked what type or how many of those invasive plants have you seen in your yard or your community? So now I want you that same question put in the chat box is now that you've looked through this presentation, are you now becoming more aware of some of the invasive plants that might be in your community and your neighborhood? <laughs> One person said, I have so many. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I see lots of them. Yes. I oh, am yes. very empathic towards you because I have to deal with them all of the time. And when I come back at the end of the summer, when I've been gone, it's just like, oh my God, they're all back. You know, it's just, it's just nonstop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there was one question that, um, there was one question that kept popping up that I think would be good to uh, reiterate. 
and that is how do you do the, the, the disposal of invasive plants. So with disposal, uh, the plants go within the normal trash. Do not go and do not put them in the yard waste because the yard waste essentially they're going to take it out to um, and they they kind of just chip everything up and mulch it all together and that's you can get free mulch so it's and they'll compost it so it can end up going back out into the landscapes so all invasive plants um, do not put them in your normal yard waste put them in your trash bag them up and put them in the trash yes so um yeah, oh I, just keep, I just keep a, a big trash can filled with a bag or two, double bag it, so that I can just roll it around with me and just fill it up and and put it in my, and actually I use my neighbor's trash can because they have the giant size trash can and I have the littlest one. So I, we have one person that's not here in town a lot, so we can just bag it up and use their big trash can mm -hmm. for our yard waste. And even with like if the seeds or any parts of the weeds don't compost them, you can put the seeds and they won't break down and you just have a seed bank within your compost that can end up spreading. So um, I would avoid, avoid all weeds within or the invasive plants within your compost, put it all into uh, normal trash. So um, let's see here. So are you gonna have to go through some of these, these, these um, these questions, we got quite a bit on here. So, um, so some of them I'm going to skip over because we've already answered kind of them a little bit. Um, one question is how do you, is there ways that you can work with the counties for like invasive plant removal? Unfortunately, no. Um, you know, at least in Alachua County, I don't think we have any way to help that the county helps with invasive plant removal. Um, but you know what, Taylor, there are groups of people that are forming like monthly um, invasive plant removal. So if you mm -hmm. if you um, watch for that or look for that, uh, we may even in my neighborhood they were thinking it'd be nice for me to walk around in the neighborhood or pick somebody's house and just have people meet there and then we'll walk around and I'll point out the invasives in that yard so that they become very familiar with their own yard and the other neighbors become more familiar with the invasives but um so we're, we're thinking about doing that in Sugarfoot um and I think but there are other groups sometimes you can find them I don't even know how I find them but sometimes they come pop up on my list mm -hmm. of things to do mm -hmm. so um or start so, one start a group yeah very true um let's see so some questions about Lantana Susie can you talk a little bit about the difference between how to recognize between an invasive lantana and like our native lantana and I'll be right back okay I, I think if I'm not mistaken and um, Colin you can help me with this the uh, lantana that is the the invasive one is the this the orange orange yellow um, right. invasive is that correct? I think that's yes, the one that's the that's most the invasive. Yeah, it's all over. Uh, there's a lot of it along 43rd, uh, 43rd Street, for example, by the, the, uh, the, the library there in Bank of America in the unkempt part. It just spreads wildly. It's, it's terrible. Okay, let's see. Native lantana has a yellow flower, whereas invasive lantana has a multitude of flower colors. Well, the, the one in your picture is, it looks like the invasive one that, that yes. is right there on the, on the top right. And I think it's because it's like orange and yellow. It has yeah. lots of different colors, but the one, the, the yellow flower, all yellow is the native lantana. That's correct. Yeah, it has to be all yellow. If you start having multicolor, you're going to be the invasive and the, the purple is invasive as well. So there are sterile varieties that you can get. And I always tell if it's sterile or not is if it goes to seed. So after flowering, you'll see the little black seeds develop on all the flowers. Um, if it develops those, then it's more than likely invasive one. It's the okay. yellow ones that are sold in the main, the, the, the non-invasive ones that you find in the garden stores. At this time of year and a little later, you find them in the box stores, mm -hmm. the yellow ones. Yes. Yeah. Whereas you never find the invasive, well, I, I won't say never. But, uh, <laughs> Somebody's bound to want to sell it. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And that brings up another question because there's a couple questions that I answered throughout the presentation was um, if they're invasive, can I still buy them in the store? And the answer is yes. So um, that's a very good good point to make because just because they're invasive plants does not mean that they're illegal to sell. There are a handful of plants that are prohibited for sale, for sell, um, and those are by state statute. So we have state statute that actually determines what those prohibited plants are and you cannot sell those. Um, so you can still find invasive plants all over the place. You know, you just go to normal nurseries, you can find some invasive plants. Usually, it's, it's not that big of a deal, but you can still find them there. So that's why education is so key because, you know, the invasive Boston fern, it's still sold at a lot of nurseries. Um, and sometimes you'll even find that they're mislabeled as like a sword fern, as like one of our natives, but it's not, it's the invasive Boston. And the differentiating the two, you can't really do unless you pull it up out of the ground. So that's an important thing to make the state is that just because it's invasive does not mean it's illegal to sell. So you can still find them at nurseries. Mexican petunia is still all over, unfortunately. Yes. <laughs> In the stores, I mean. Yes, yeah, they are. <laughs> they are. And it kills me. I go through those stores and I go, what are they still selling this for? What are they still selling this for? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's, a, there's another side to that, though. There are some plants that are on the, on the list that they're selling that are non-invasive up here, but we're still not allowed officially to uh, to utilize them and, and uh-huh. you know, sell them in our in our master gardener plant sale. Yeah. So our uh, on May 15th, we have our master gardener plant sale. It's at Cuscawilla, which is the old Camp McConnell in Micanopy. And we set standard we set higher standards for what plants that we can and cannot sell so based off of the ifas assessment page anything that's listed as caution or worse um, on that page in north and central florida we don't sell um, at our plant sale Um, just because we're kind of on the edge of the north and central florida based off of ifas assessment and we know people will bring people in from marion county We've even brought in people from Orange County, but um, so we do that as a way to kind of set a standard for what making sure that we're not having invasive species, because even though it's it might not be invasive here in Alachua, it could be invasive somewhere else. So we try to take that in consideration. Taylor, I noticed somebody Bonda uh, commented, I also don't like my neighbor's low quad tree and she's constantly pulling up seedlings. I'll, 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 I'll second that in space. I have a lovely <laughs> lady behind me, but uh, you, you, all the plants, most of the plants that were mentioned, wisteria comes through, the loquat, the nephrolensis, uh, tradescanthia. I, I'm constantly fighting and even mimosa uh, coming through the fence and over the fence. My air. It's, <sighs> it's a constant battle. Yeah, I was going to ask everybody if they've had experiences with neighbors, because I've had a neighbor that, you know, blames me for the coral ordesia. And I'm like, I've only been here 16 years, and this thing was here when I came here. And, <laughs> yeah. it, you know, let's and, just keep working as a team to try to get rid of it between our properties, you know? Yeah, and I think it's important, is there's no recourse with the your neighbors or anything like that. It's just education and communication and having good dialogue to help yeah. educate on why we need to make these changes. So yeah, share this, share this um, PowerPoint with your neighbors, have a neighborhood meeting, share it with your neighbors so they get to know what's invasive in your neighborhood, you know, definitely. Oh yeah, and somebody else commented about a neighbor who plants bamboo along the property line. Uh, yes, uh, I bought so-called clumping bamboo from uh, Kanapaha years ago, and it wasn't, and uh, oh, gee. and I, I had to pay quite a lot of money to people to, to finally get that rid of that bamboo. I, I would advise most people about bamboo, especially if you have a small garden, and uh, we get questions about bamboo removal in the help desk quite a lot as well, and uh, if, if you have bamboo growing among trees, it is really hard to, um, to uh, <laughs> eliminate that. I actually have two clumping bamboos. They're about 20 feet wide 
that, you know, of course, is 70 years old, down in the back, like, uh, woodsy area of my property. And I have friends that come and just cut around the edge whenever they need stakes for their gardens and everything. Um, so I know that helps, you know. But I also have one that I don't think is clumping. I think it's a black bamboo, maybe. I'm not sure. But I keep it in a pot on a patio that has no yeah, one. Mine went underneath the fence, and that, that was not popular. So no. oh I'd be God. guilty as well. <laughs> we learn from our mistakes. Yes. So um, there, there's a still a, a lot of questions that we do have. Um, so let's see what we can get through. Because I know we have a lot of questions on very specific management and control of certain uh species or plants so i actually i'll encourage you because i we won't be able to get to all of these today um i'm putting an email address into the chat box it's mag at alachawacounty.us that's the master gardener volunteer help desk so you can send those specific questions on how to um, manage specific invasive plants that are within your your landscape and we can pull up those recommendations um, for invasive plants for you know I saw one question about like our native grapevine you know it, it grows great but in undisturbed air or in disturbed areas where we don't have natural fire management it grows like crazy so there are different ways that we can talk about different management specific management for specific plants because I know we just won't be able to get to them this evening so I apologize for that um, a grapevine makes good wreaths and that's the way I keep mine down. Is I just wrap them up like I'm wrapping a, an electrical cord or something and I make a wreath out of it and then I've cleared it out of the area. <laughs> so now we should be having some uh, wreaths at our plant sale from Susie's. <laughs> oh, yes. I've got tons. I've got tons. Oh my gosh. Um, there's another link I put in, and I think it's important just because I know some people are starting to sign off. Um, I put a follow-up survey in the chat box. We do this with all of our programs as a way for us to learn how to improve our programs. Um, so please take a few minutes and fill this out. Um, I will also follow up with an email in the next couple of days. I try to get it out the same week. It'll be a copy of this presentation. It will also be a link to our YouTube channel where you can find a recording of this webinar and as well as a bunch of different resources that we covered and talked about in this evening's program. Um, so those resources and I'll also include that uh, survey link in that email. Um, so I do know that like we can hang out for a few more minutes. Uh, we still got time but I just want to make sure that we cover all that before um, everybody leaves. more people yeah there was a question about briar of uh, briar vines a uh, little while I, i'm looking for it now because like green briar yeah uh, or smilex not smilex no i mean that's bad enough if you have it but, uh, <laughs> oh but did you know that the top of the smilex is edible it the tastes like asparagus. Yeah, you can, where yeah. it breaks off, like an asparagus, you know how you break the asparagus where it just naturally breaks? At the top of the smilac, if you break it like uh, that, it'll break off and it's tender and it's good. It's good, it's edible. But you need to be very careful because you don't know if those have been sprayed or treated or anything Oh yeah, like you that. have to be in a place where you know. Yeah. Yeah. But, but if you see that lots of the deer have been eating the tops, that's usually an indication that they're pretty good. True. Um, but yeah, because you can go along and see all of them off, 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 you know, for half a mile. And then you can find it's really one. hard to dig up a smile axe. <laughs> <That's Yeah. cool>. <laughs> Someone yeah. asked if they can adopt us. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but the nice thing is if you're in Alachua County, you know, our Master Gardener volunteers were available to all Alachua County residents, you know, that MAG at AlachuaCounty.us. That's our Master Gardener volunteer help desk. That's a great way to send in pictures and questions or problems that you're having with your landscape and yard. And we can help get those resources to you for management based off of the science and what we, what we have with the University of Florida. Now, obviously, we're not just Alachua County. Master Gardener volunteers are active all over the state in the respective counties. So we actually have a program, I think in 60 of the 67 counties throughout the state. Um, so you can always reach out to your county extension office um, if you're not in Alachua County to try to get the most 
appropriate resources because sometimes our recommendations change based off of where you're at in the state and due to timing of when to apply different herbicides or when things are you can expect them to grow in your yard. So um, always use IFAS extension as your resource. Um, you know, we're active in every single county and you can always search up your county extension office by just going on to Google or Bing or whatever and you just type in your county and then University of Florida extension and you'll get your web page with your county extension office. Or um, the, Taylor, there's also the um, IFAS EDIS, the electronic data information. Yeah, service. that's so a you, great one. If so you have a specific plant or question, just type that into that and um, well, it's amazing how much information is in there. Yeah, let me um, let me. Sure I have that. I may ha I may have Edis, the sfyl.ifas.ufl.edu. That mm -hmm. takes you to Edis, and you can click on Edis. You can find Edis on that um, website. So I have Ed I have Edis bookmarked now well, because I you. use it so much. Good for so you. I'm going to show an example real quick uh, because I think this is an important thing to share with others. I'm going to I'm going to steal the script, uh, share screen um, All right. from you. Um, so I'm just on Google, and say you wanted something you wanted to learn about cat's claw. So you type in cat's claw, whatever your topic is, and then you can type E D I S, and then hit enter. Um, well, we get those supplements as ads, but you're, the, <laughs> first, the first things you get are going to be all associated with the University of Florida. So documents, I really like the Center for Aquatic Invasive Plants because you can click on there and it's like, oh, look at this. It shows a bunch of pictures. So like here's the seed pot that I was talking about, the long green bean type seed pots yeah. of cat's claw. Yeah. Um, and it also shows information about control methods and IPM strategies, preventative, cultural, mechanical, biological, then chemical. So this is a cool little little website. Um, so anyways, so that's, a, that's one trick is you just go to Google and you type EDIS with your keyword and it, you can help pull some information up. So, um, and then the last thing I wanted to show everybody is because I promised I'd show this picture was the picture of the Caesar weed hands. There we go. Oh, yes. Great. Let me, I, I was able to get that on my computer. Now I have to actually open it up. Um, here we go. So screen share. Wait till you see these hands. Oh, oh my. Look at that. <laughs> They're also in her hair. They're everywhere. <laughs> oh, and just imagine if you have fleece on. They're all over the fleece jacket mm -hmm. or fleece pants. Mm -hmm. <gasps> That's so, a great shot. And that was from um, that was from the Great Raider Rally where we were able to get special permissions to go out to the SOS garden and do invasive control that That's day. the day I was there. Man, yeah, that was, that was the day, day you had your fleece on. Yeah. Oh my God. It was just all over because it was really cold in the morning. So yeah. Look at that. That's so, amazing. Um, so what I would recommend is just reach out to us about uh, the specific plant material to the MAG or if you're out of county, out of Alachua, reach out to your um, um, your local county extension office to get the most up to date. A lot of these plants that we mentioned today are invasive across the entire state, but there might be somewhere like if you're in far South Florida, it might not be considered invasive or vice versa. Um, so just always make sure you check those local websites or local things for um, resources for what's specific in your area. Taylor, somebody asked a question, where can I get the list of plants that are evil enough that they can't be owned or bought? Is that part of the FL? Uh, no, it's not part of FLEPSI. Well, those plants no. are on the FLEPSI. Let me, uh, it's a state statute. I'm gonna see if I can oh. find it real quick. It's oh, the yeah. prohibited plants. Because the, the, at the end of the, of the PowerPoint is the list of the plants that are from the 2019 invasive plant list. Um, so that at least gives you the names and of them, and you can you have that to carry with you. But boy, if they if they know the Florida statute, they can tell the people where they're who's selling them. They better stop selling them. Yeah. Um, and let me. Where is it? 
I'm, I can't remember. I always have to look it up because I don't, I don't know the state statute number for it. So I have to search until I find it. <laughs> While you're searching, um, Joseph Keller had sent a question in about discovering he had the native grapevines that were uh, inundating his wooded area. And he wanted to know if uh, they should still make efforts to curtail the growth, uh, even if it's non-invasive. His woods are looking much healthier without them. And of course, when you're working in a natural environment, uh, if, if you're working, uh, if you live near a state park or preserve, you want to show some caution. But on your own property, you want to maintain the health of your environment as a whole. And if it's taking over, there is absolutely no reason why you shouldn't be able to cut back some of those grape vines and, and keep them in check. I've done the same on my own property and the, the native trees and some of the underbrush has improved so much because they've got more light coming to them because I cut back some of the vines. Now, mind you, you will never get them all. Uh, we have pulled up or attempted to pull up some roots that are almost as big as my head. And you kind of just have to chop it and keep it in check. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, definitely have used an, an ax more frequently in the past two years than any other time. <laughs> but uh, if you notice that it's, it's improving the health of your trees, and uh, some of the uh, undergrowth. I happen to live right next to a, a state park. My, my property backs right up into it. So I've got a lot, of, uh, a lot of things going on in that area for wildlife and so forth. So I keep that in mind, but um, it's definitely created a more healthy environment. And I actually have a lot more activity out there now as a result. So use caution, you know, use your best judgment, but uh, improvement is always better, right? <laughs> so that would be my input there. And I, I put two links in the um, chat box. One I just discovered, I didn't know that we had this, but it's from the University of Florida. It's like all invasive plant laws for the state, um, which is kind of neat. I did not know we had this. And then I also put that specific, like a PDF of like our noxious weed list and it's not statute. It looks like it's just Florida administrative code. So I misspoke. But great. Um, thank you. That's great to know. So that's a cool. That's a cool uh, resource. I didn't know existed. So the more you know, right? <laughs> yeah, something new every day. Uh huh. Well, uh, we got a couple more minutes for questions. Um, let's see. Well, let's see what we got because we're slated to go towards five thirty, but I any minute now my kids are going to come busting through the door so as normal that's how I usually know that the end it's we're coming to a conclusion when my kids show up um, <laughs> um so someone's mentioning that they do have uh oh yeah the briar vines of smilex so yes you can do if you have like briars or smilex you can do it's harder to do a cut stump method just because of how many exist um, but you could theoretically, you could cut it and just like a little Q-tip, you just dip a little herbicide onto where you made that cut. But you have to do that right when you make the cut for it to be most effective. Yes. So, because you can hand pull, no problem, but it'll just grow back um, eventually. Um, so, but the, again, depending on what it is, the type of herbicide, it can vary from plant to plant. So just because we know that some plants respond differently to different herbicides. So you just don't want to just go out and spray whatever herbicide you have um, because we do have some good recommendations for some of those. And you could dig up all the tubes. Yeah, that <laughs> definitely can. That's, you know, for my PM strategies, that is most preferred. Is it's, It is a lot of work, but you can do it. I do it for the ones in my yard, um, but it's not too overwhelming. So just periodically, I just go out and just, where I see a briar or something, Smilex growing up, I go down and try to dig it up. So my, uh, there we go. Somebody asked, will they, um, uh, 
micro brushing work for a, a, air pota a potato by air potato vine, I imagine. I don't know. I haven't tried it. Anybody on the panel have a... Was that, uh, can you say that question again? Uh, that was the last question. Will that work? Um, oh, on an air potato vine. Air um, potato. Let, let me look up that control Seriously, method. I think I have I that. mean, on the air potato vine, honestly, it really does, those beetles really work. Oh, they, they work. Yeah. Big time. Yeah. Our, um, Except that I panic always in, in June, May and June because I, they don't come out for a while. So I panic for about a month because it just starts growing and growing and growing. And then all of a sudden they're there and all the leaves are wholly like, you know, lace. Um, so, yeah, the, so we used to do the invasive uh, rally with the air potatoes, but the air potato beetles have been doing wonderful. And I just looked it up, um, Garlon for larger stems, you can do garlon like a cut and then you just a little bit of garlon on it will will work so um but it says will require follow-up treatments and that's just because of how invasive it is yeah. so it'll, it, it seems like it will help with some of the control thank you for joining us yeah it was great it was fun it's always fun to learn new things yeah Oh, one person mentioned, does pickerel weed take over rapidly and expand in a lake? I wish. I'm answering it now. <laughs> Are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll answer live. How's that? Uh, no, it doesn't like deep water. It's great for strengthening uh, the edges of a pond uh, up to a certain depth, but the deeper the water gets, the less it likes it, and it will not take over the water unless you have a two-foot lake. Um, it might, but normally, no. <laughs> One of my favorite times of year is when you're driving across Payne's Prairie yes. and all the pickerel is flowering. It's a sea oh. of purple. Oh, mm -hmm. it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. It is beautiful, especially on 441 because you can drive a little bit slower. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you're sitting a little lower too. <laughs> so Next month, as I remember. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's that's one that's like one of the best times of the year to me. I mean, our, our wildflowers right now are doing wonderful. Yeah, they are. But I always love when the pickerel weeds flowering. Yes. Uh, one question is: Would you recommend placing removed torpedo grass into the trash as opposed to yard waste? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, do not put uh, that in any any of the things into yard waste um, invasives. So best way to remove cat claw vine that's 25, 35 feet up in an oak tree. Um, if it's already climbing, the best thing is to at the base of it. Christy, you have an answer? Yeah. Yeah. Well, as I have been doing in my own yard this past year, we still have a couple of rogues that, that we're catching up with. But if you cut it at the base of the vine, let it die off and then pull it out. It, once it's browned up, that is the easiest way to go about it because uh, they the leaves won't stick to any other foliage or anything that's still up there that you want to keep. Uh, once they're brown and crumbly, it makes it a whole lot easier to, to yank those vines out. A little bit of patience, but that's the e at least that's the easiest way I have found to do it. Find the base, snip it, let it die, and then yank it down. Mm -hmm. That's what I do with most of them when they're that big. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. Virginia creeper. I mean, it's not invasive, but do you all have recommendations for Virginia creeper? I just pull it out when it's in the yeah. wrong place. Yeah. yeah, as soon as I see the seedlings up here, I pull them out. It's 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 funny because when their plants aren't invasive, but they, sometimes they can be considered weedy or a nuisance. The invasive ones, we have a really good list of IPM strategies, um, but we don't always have like that same detailed control or outline of control for some other plants like Virginia creeper. Um, but hand removal is always going to be the the easiest so the little, just the little up. ones are beginning to appear right now you know and yeah. uh, just pull them out <laughs> if you can been making yeah. my rounds too <laughs> and i and i don't know if you can i don't think it's possible to um permanently remove them so you can stay ahead of them 
Um, and you may knock down the population substantially. Um, you can't, you will knock down the population substantially if you're, if you're managing it, but they'll still end up coming back. But as long as you're aware and you notice it, you pull it out they, before it gets out of control. Still, the seeds still drift or something, whatever. I'm not quite sure what, how they propagate, but. Uh, They're good uh, at it. <laughs> <laughs> know that much. <laughs> there was a question about goldenrod. Um, it, it's an aggressive in somebody's yard. And I know I've got tons. I'm gonna change my path to accommodate this whole bunch of goldenrod that grows. Um, but it hasn't grown any further than that. You know, it just stays it's in its own space and it's hard to get rid of. If you wanna make a path where it is, it still comes up in your path. So mm -hmm. I guess uh, just make your path around it. <laughs> just <laughs> leave it be and make your path, you know, walk around it, don't go through it. And someone asked about the Bergia grandiflora and I'm trying to see what our, I'm trying to pull up those recommendations. What is that? Uh, Thunbergia. Thunbergia, the clock yeah, vine. Um, I don't know whether I know clock vine. I can't find it easily. So that might be one that we have to follow up with. <laughs> yeah, somebody asked, how do I kill wandering Jew without Roundup? Don't use Roundup. <laughs> That's my first one, my first recommendation. <laughs> just pull it, just pull it. Yeah, and bag it immediately. Yeah, pull it, bag trash. it, and put it in your trash, in your, your, your you know, real uh, house trash. Yeah, that's, it, it, that one's a tough one to control. There's, I don't think we have a biological control. Um, so cultural and mechanical. And then outside of that, that's just when you do get to chemicals. So if, if it's just too overwhelming, <laughs> Sorry, barking dog. Um, <laughs> when it's too overwhelming, that's when you end up um, having to use an herbicide, but hand pulling and mechanical is going to be best. Oh, it must be 530. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Feeding time. There, there it is. <laughs> that's your alarm clock. <laughs> you can do the cut, the cut stump method with, uh, with the tongue oil trees, but I'm not sure if the garlon is the best for it off the top of my head. Well, goodness. So I want to thank everybody for joining us. And I know we didn't get to all the questions, but um, we'll follow up with some more information. Again, always feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions um, that we didn't answer or anything like that, or something might come to you later, but we'll follow up with an email with all that information. Um, so Susie, I want to thank you You're welcome. Uh, again for doing this. This is, this is a great presentation and um, thank you both Colin and Christy for joining us today and helping out. Yeah. Okay. So. Thanks right. for all the questions. They keep me on my toes. <laughs> <laughs>